Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for attending this information session to learn more about the Action Research Collaborative, also known as ARC. We've been getting a ton of emails, especially <laughs> since the Cornell Chronicle article was released last month, um, requesting to learn more. And um, so we thought, let's have an info session where we can share more about our mission for ARC and also for us to answer any questions that you have. But before we get started, I think it'd be great if both Neil and I introduce ourselves. So I will start. My name is Tashara Leek, and I'm an assistant professor in the Division of Nutritional Sciences. I also have a secondary faculty appointment in general internal medicine at our medical school in New York City. Broadly, you all might be asking, how do I engage in action research? And so what I do is I partner with various community organizations and community partners in New York City to identify ways that we remediate the impacts of structural racism and poverty on marginalized communities in New York City, especially as it relates to food insecurity, nutrition, and health. So what does that actually look like? It's one example is I partnered with City Harvest in New York City to talk about the lack of food access in, again, these marginalized communities, how there's an abundance of corner stores, but limited grocery stores available. And you go to these corner stores all the time to buy snacks, before school, after school, during school. And so we worked together um, to conduct research to assess what these stores had available. And then we worked with a distributor to actually make these grab and goes. We surveyed store owners and youth going in and out of these stores. And now as a result of this work, corner stores in New York City, especially in Washington Heights are actually selling grab and go snacks. So this is an example of how researchers can work with community organizations and work with community and people to solve real problems. My work um, is funded by a variety of sources, but I especially want to acknowledge that I am greatly funded by the USDA and also NIH. With that, I can pass the baton to, to Neil. Good morning, everyone. Um, building on uh, Tashara's points, um, I'll quickly introduce myself. So I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Communication. I'm in Ithaca, and I also have a secondary appointment at the medical school in the Division of General Internal Medicine. Um, my action research um, work spans a few different domains. Um, I do work in education, working on um, education disparities, um, work in the health domain, uh, some work in criminal justice, some in environmental sustainability. All um, like to share done um, in partnership with a variety of um, communities and community organizations, um, some upstate, some downstate New York City, um, as well as in partnerships um, with policy entities um, that can use research to then inform policy action. So some of those partners include um, the Department of Health in the city, um, at the federal level, Department of Health and Human Services, and during the pandemic, also done some work with the White House on um, equity in the pandemic response. And similarly with um, supports from uh, funders like the CDC, USDA, and a variety of foundations. Um, but we thought we'd start off by talking a bit more about like, what do we mean by action research? Why did we choose this name? And then um, dive into um, some of the work further before opening up for broader discussion. So, the term action research actually um, has its roots here um, at Cornell. Uh, so Kurt Lewin was a social scientist um, here back in the 1930s. Um, he fled Nazi Germany um, and came here to Cornell to be faculty member in what was then the Department of Public Economics, um, a department that eventually became the College of uh, Human Ecology. Um, and Lewin was interested in the effects of social action, specifically actions that led to the marginalization of different groups in society. Um, he, you know, being a Jewish man, had experienced marginalization um, in the German context, but then came to the U.S. and saw um, how Black people and other um, groups in the U.S. were marginalized, and that bothered him. And so he thought, um, as scientists, we not only had an obligation to study um, how these things came to be, how these processes worked, but that we should also conduct research um, in partnership with others that could lead to social action, that could change these outcomes, that could improve the lives of the most marginalized and vulnerable members of our society. Um, so he didn't just talk the talk on this, he walked the walk. Um, this is the kind of work that he did when he was here at Cornell, and he continued to do long after he left Cornell. Um, at the end of his life, um, a year before he uh, passed away, 
Um, he wrote um, what's essentially, uh, I think of as a playbook on how to do this kind of work well. This is uh, one of the papers I refer back to um, often where he outlines um, some key pillars on um, how to do um, this action work with a purpose um, that can advance um, equity issues in society. And many of the things he's talked about um, are some of the pillars that guide our contemporary work in this um, action research collaborative at Cornell. So this takes us to now, you know, this, let's bring back um, our commitment to action research. And so Neil Lewis and I, he'll talk a little bit about the history soon, um, developed the, in partnership, the Action Research Collaborative. And its goal is to be an institutional hub for Cornell researchers, Cornell community partners, and policymakers to work together to develop, implement, and evaluate equitable and sustainable solutions to pressing societal problems. And so you'll notice some words are bolded because this is really core to our, our mission. One being that we're coming up with equitable solutions that they're sustainable, right? So we have to have a plan for how do we actually solve problems beyond the length of a grant, a grant funding period. Um, the pressing component, right? A lot of issues are time sensitive. If you watch the news, you are seeing things that we need immediate responses to. So how do we actually collaborate together and make sure, especially as academic researchers, that we have a seat at the table when these decision, decisions are being made? Um, with all of that, what does it take to actually do this work? Well, ARC is developing the infrastructure to act for action researchers at Cornell to actually do this work. So infrastructure as well as support, um, what does that look like? Well, we need a dedicated team of researchers. We need partners who are on the ground and who know the communities well. We need policymakers who set the broader policies that govern people's lives to be engaging with us. Um, all of these people need to have a voice when policies and programs are being developed and implemented. And then we have to actually evaluate the effects of whatever we do so we can learn both now and in the present for things that may come up in the future. Yeah, so um, I'll do a bit of history and then um, that'll set up sort of how we're structured um, to give you a sense of what, how and why we're doing what we're doing. So. You know, the idea for ARC uh, began um, all the way back in 2020, um, took a few years of uh, planning to get uh, to the point of launching. Um, as you know, there was uh, a lot going on uh, in 2020. There's the pandemic, there's the murder of George Floyd and so many other issues reminded us of just how unequal um, this nation and uh, um, broader world um, is. And um, got us to really think with the institution about like, how might we deal with some of this, right? Um, that um, there was this sense that it's not enough to just continue studying how bad um, things are and publishing more papers and journals that live behind paywalls and that people can't access. Um, it's also important to do something. Um, and you know, there was a lot of desire um, in communities and policymakers to do something, but at the same time, um, sometimes a lack of clarity on what um, to do. Right, um, it's rare for um, some of the answers to these social problems to exist on the shelf. Um, you know, if we already knew how to solve it all, presumably we would have uh, done so already. So um, we had um, a number of discussions um, uh, with faculty, with, uh, with staff, with uh, administrators uh, to think about like, what could we do? What kind of infrastructure could we build to support the kind of dynamic um, exchanges that and ongoing exchanges that are necessary um, between communities, between researchers and policymakers, um, and but also take seriously the, cons the affordances and constraints faced by um, each of those uh, stakeholders so that we could um, address those uh, to work together moving forward. And so, um, you know, there are a number of challenges that uh, researchers who work within the um, university context uh, face uh, when trying to do this work. And so, we spend a lot of time thinking through these challenges um, with faculty who do this kind of work, as well as, again, um, with administrators like deans who ultimately evaluate the success uh, of those faculty. And so that process uh, led us to um, co develop this structure that could support a range of action research projects um, and the people who would work um, on those projects. 
So, you know, ARC is um, uniquely situated at Cornell. Um, it's situated between two colleges, um, between the College of Human Ecology um, and CALS, um, two colleges that view publicly engaged work as core parts of their identity. Um, and it also sits within the Bronfenbrenner Center for Translational Research, um, which has um, an amazing staff with decades of um, experience doing community um, engaged work. And so the great position, uh, the great benefit of our position between these three units is that we can combine the research um, expertise and educational resources that colleges are best um, positioned to offer with the deep community and policy expertise of a translational research center uh, to tackle big problems that would be too overwhelming for any one person or any one entity to tackle alone. Um, and so this sort of um, structure and approach simultaneously um, allows us to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of um, the kind of work that we do. It also allows us to be present in um, the various places that we need to be present to do this kind of work. So in Ithaca, uh, we have space within, the, within Martha Van Rensselaer Hall um, um, where people can gather and work together. In New York City, same thing, we have space at 570 um, Lexington Avenue, which is another place uh, to gather and work together. Um, and we'll have dedicated uh, personnel to work on these things. Um, so we're in the process of hiring postdocs. Um, there are students that are involved with this work. Um, there'll be staff involved with this work who can be physically present in both places so that we can respond um, in real time. Um, and then uh, we have to, of course, support um, everyone involved. So there'll be various types of support for all of those people, support for faculty, support for students, support for communities. Um, and support um, for policymakers who also want advice to make sure they're putting um, evidence uh, behind the policies they're developing. And so to share, we'll talk about some of those um, activities now. Yeah, so what you should think or of ARC as is not a think tank, but a do tank. And so it's this idea that, again, we want to figure out how to make real impact in the world um, with using research. And so in terms of activities and how do we actually support faculty to do this work, we're hosting monthly workshops. And this is an opportunity for us to gather, for us to share, exchange ideas. If someone has a grant that they would like feedback on, if someone is experiencing any challenges um, in the various communities that they're working in, this is a place, again, just for us to build community and engage with one another in our, in our respective work and also to foster collaboration. You know, typically there's about one or two action researchers per department. And so the goal is when we all gather, we're, we're stronger and can support each other's efforts. Um, the other thing is to provide ongoing professional development and support. So one issue that's come up and really an exciting opportunity is that a lot of times policymakers will contact the university to say, hey, there is a policy decision that needs to be made. Do you have, do you know a professor who has expertise in X, Y, and Z? And most of us on this call are researchers or scientists of some sort. We're not particularly trained in how to engage in policymakers. So one example is providing that training um, to ARC um, affiliates and members on how do you actually engage with policymakers. And again, to create infrastructure so that it doesn't dominate your time. So that means how do we have students, if we need to develop a quick one pager, could we have, we'll have um, dedicated art graduate students who can help us with developing that. Um, another activity that's very important that we are launching is our evaluation unit. Um, so the ARC evaluation unit is really important. A lot of us who do this work, it's been challenging to see our community partners don't necessarily have the infrastructure sometimes to evaluate their work, which is important because as they're applying for their own funding, they need to say, hey, we created this great program. Was it effective? How did it actually impact people? Um, and so this is one way in which we can partner um, with community organizations to say, okay, let's help with designing you know, your project, making sure that it's evidence-based, how do we actually help you evaluate your program, and then help you then to apply for subsequent funding to keep your organization afloat and thriving, really, not just afloat. Um, also with policymakers, um, Neil and I have been engaged in a lot of conversations the past couple of weeks with various um, senators and assemblymen across New York State, and it was clear that there are various bills being put forth and there's a lack of understanding or an opportunity to figure out how do these bills actually impact people's lives. And this is another way in which the evaluation unit could be 
be of, of use. And then the last thing that I'll briefly mention is that we will be hosting an annual symposium for researchers who engage in action research with marginalized populations. And so what this looks like is an, it's an opportunity to again gather researchers, community organizations, and policymakers in one space to really see how can we function as a do think and so people are aware of one another and that we can start collaborating um, together to solve these again these pressing issues. So what what are what's next for us? Um, we we started January one and we've been incredibly busy these past what seven weeks and so one of our big goals is to develop shareable resources and these will be. Um, some of this will be housed on our, our website that is forthcoming. Um, we are very much in the process of hiring and training new ARC staff. And those staff, again, we will have staff that's based in Ithaca, as well as staff based in New York City. And then we're spending a lot of time on developing the ARC evaluation unit. So these are kind of our biggest tasks that we're focused on for the semester and the summer. We really need to spend time on making sure it's clear what our values are and creating infrastructure for us to be successful. Yeah, at this time we can um, open it up uh, for questions. Um, we, want, we want this to be interactive. So if there are things that um, you'd like us to discuss, um, feel free to raise your hand or if you wanna uh, message us in the chat, we can moderate that way. And I apologize for the background noise. The city decided that was a good time to work on the street outside. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hi, I have a question. Yes. Hi, Tashara, it's nice to see you. And hi, Neil. It's Jessica Ingram Bellamy, Cornell alum, class of 92. And as Tashara knows, um, I'm a director of communications and partnerships for the Bureau of Chronic Disease Prevention at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. So this is all very exciting. As a Cornellian, I'm very proud to see this is happening. I think it's high time that we put research into action to make change especially um, in communities where we see disinvestment. So my question for you both uh, is, how long does it take from the time that um, a project is conceived or a research project is conceived to actually put boots on the ground and to get things operationalized? That's a great question. So I would say this was actually one of the reasons we developed ARC is because traditionally, Academics, we all know things happen very slowly, right? Yeah. And so you have an idea, then you identify funding, and then you apply for funding, and then you might get it a year later. And there's some problems with that. Um, and that, you know, by that time, some of these issues, again, have been going on for a year. And so yeah, ARC is established so we can respond more quickly. We're pursuing some non-federal funding opportunity so that we have infrastructure to respond in more real time. We also have funding for seed grants so that we can work faster. I had an experience, I will give an example last summer where I was partnering with the Boys and Girls Club of Harlem. This is like what we're in the middle of the pandemic. A lot of youth haven't engaged with one another in person. So we are already seeing the impacts of being remote, right, on mm -hmm. the well-being of children and adolescents. And so the Boys and Girls Club was like, hey, we're ready. Like, let's let's meet and let's have a program in person. We talked of, and we developed a youth advocacy and food justice program. And but then I was like, oh my gosh, it's March. I don't have time to apply for an NIH grant um, to yeah. get this off the ground by July. And so working in collaboration with various folks in my college and alumni, we were able to get support to run that program. So we conceptualized the idea in March and the program was up and running by July. So okay. that's a unique case, right? Where it was just me, but there's opportunities for us to have that type of infrastructure for multiple projects. And that's again, what our goal is with art. Okay, okay. So to, we have to move faster um, because there's just a lot of limitations, of course, in waiting the year. And yeah. So you and need unrestricted also, funding. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And it also, I think I've experienced where it questions like trust, right? 
it's like, here comes this researcher from this, you know, elite institution coming in saying that they're going to help. And then what does it mean when we can't respond for a year, year and a half later? And we're having to explain, well, this is actually best case scenario. We got this great on the first go round, but it's a year later. And so I also think by being able to respond, especially to particular issues in real time, will help us establish and maintain trust. Yeah, great. Thank you so much for your response. Thank you. Yeah, I want to quickly um, add to that. Um, so, you know, in addition to the resources, so, um, you know, financial resources to respond, having the people who are ready to go uh, is really helpful. And that's one of the things, one of the reasons we uh, emphasize so much having dedicated personnel. So the version of uh, the story that the chair just told that I experienced over the past year was being able to respond to the pandemic. So there are groups I've been working with um, in New York City, for instance, for five years, um, that when we started working together, we were working on environmental justice things uh, or air pollution things, but now the pandemic became uh, the central issue and we needed to um, respond um, to, uh, especially around vaccination efforts. So um, having yeah. people who could, um, having people who could help um, do the work, figuring out what research is relevant right away, um, what are the ways to translate that um, into practice and then continuously collect the data as we're, um, as programs are being rolled out um, to then um, evaluate how things are going. That was critical and we've continued that work. And now we're at a point where, um, as I think many people are throughout the country, starting to think about how do we sustain that moving forward um, beyond COVID is sort of the language being used. Of course, COVID is still with us, but um, thinking about addressing equity issues more broadly. It's not just um, COVID and um, health. It's also the educational issues that are going to continue. There's so many dimensions that have yeah. come up that we have to keep working on. Thank you, Neil. Uh, Kareem, see you. Thank you. And I, th I, th I think my little tilde and the, and the I help you pronounce it, Kareem and not Kareem. Um, thanks for the presentation. I'm a practitioner with Cornell Cooperative Extension, Tompkins County, and me and my colleagues are engaged in all sorts of wonderful programming. I work on energy and climate and uh, justice issues and colleagues who are working with food and food justice and food access issues, et cetera, et cetera. So just I, if you could explain to me how how you see a, a potential collaboration with, with practitioners uh, doing this work on the ground. I, just as an example, I coordinate a program for NYSERDA, the New York State Energy Research Development Authority for the Southern Tier region, that's eight counties. And we're tasked with um, supporting people, especially with people with uh, limited income, low or moderate income, 80% or under the area median income with learning about and accessing energy programs that can help reduce their energy bills and carbon footprint. And this is a uh, program is going to grow with a regional energy hub uh, in the coming four years. So just as an example of the type of work that are engaging hundreds, thousands of people uh, every year, mostly from uh, lower income communities around this type of work. Yeah, I'm not so I'm I'm not sure if it may be helpful to give an example of something that we've already done. And so I will I see a couple of folks on here from CUCE New York City. Um, so I'll give you all a little shout out here. And so when I arrived at Cornell, it was clear um, I, I knew that I was going to set up all of my research in New York City. I'm an urban researcher. And so I partner with um, Extension and I predom predominantly work with uh, adolescents. And so I was visiting with principals at schools. And so I would say one way in which action research stands out versus maybe traditional research is I didn't come in with like a solution already to a problem. I went into schools and I asked a very open-ended question, which is what are your priorities? What, what's going on here? And a lot of the comments were about, we wanna make sure our middle schoolers are prepared for college. We also wanna make sure that they're well. And the word well was used in the broadest sense, um, social emotional learning. Um, just very broad. And so with that, I partnered with CUCE New York City and with 4-H, um, both in New York City and um, um, 4-H at Cornell University to develop an after-school program called the Advanced Cooking Education Program. And that program is really unique in that it centers the various cultural identities in New York City. 
and it's very multi-component. Um, we worked with the schools to figure out what the different components of this after-school program should be. Um, we also, but also I want to really highlight the sustainability part of this, and I think this is also very unique and an example of action research. So New York City Department of Child and Youth Development will fund after-school programs if they're on their approved list. So our long-term goal is to get ACE, so many acronyms, the Advanced Cooking Education Program, on the approved list of programming. So after the USDA funding ends, the city will then pay for this after-school program and extension can continue to lead, lead that program, but we will have an evidence-based program. So when I say evidence-based, it's again, culturally relevant. We're seeing that it's impacting um, the well-being of these lives. So this is an example of how you have a researcher partnering with extension. We got, and we have an advisory board. We got feedback and have constantly engaged with the schools and the students. Um, the other part I would highlight about action research is that we are in community with community. I am not popping in and out um, just to conduct research. I'm, a, I'm attending PTA meetings. I have helped with career fairs. Um, I am a part of these schools communities. And so that again allows us to have a continued relationship beyond the length of the grant. After this after school program is all up and running, we're gonna then I'm gonna stay in these schools and communities and we're gonna work on the next project. So that's just like one example. Um, I know Neil has had other examples of how he's engaged with these multiple entities. Yeah, I'll just quickly add to what um, Sarah was saying um, by noting that um, having um, researchers there on the ground with practitioners is critical. Um, and I'll, I'll quickly share an example from yesterday with um, so another um, shout out to uh, CUCE uh, partnerships. Uh, we've been working together on vaccination efforts um, and the continuous, um, the um, continuous exchanges has been critical for that, right? Hearing what's going on on the ground and then pairing that with um, new evidence, not just from um, the locations that we're in, but um, having um, new research from across the country to figure out like what's working in different places, what's not, um, how does that, um, how might that change what we are doing on the ground here? Um, having those continuous um, dialogues um, is really um, important for continuing to advance our work. So um, it's not an either or thing. Um, working together is actually critical. Um, so I see Thank you. Just, just want to say, I would love, you know, even a connection with staff like who are interested. I would love to have somebody like you to, to, to Shara, sorry. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, a company, help us think about the questions, help us think about ways to connect with other resources. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I see. Hey, uh, Charles. Yeah, thank you. My name is uh, Charles Izzo. I'm with the, the Brown from Brenner Center and the Residential Child Care Project within the center. Um, I just wanted to see if you could uh, uh, talk a little bit more about the evaluation unit that you, you mentioned and you know, how that's going to play out. And, and also, particularly, to what extent do you think you'll be you know, connecting with the evaluation expertise you know, sitting in the room here and across our various uh, organizations? Thanks. Would you like for me to take, I can start us off, Neil. So um, we are already in communications with um, BCTR. So one thing I will say is that we, Neil and I have been engaging with BCTR since we've been here. Um, BCTR has been incredibly supportive of both of us and our work. And some of ARC, the development of ARC was really to figure out how to bring more faculty into BCTR. And so regarding the evaluation unit, um, we will again be split. We'll have a team that's in Ithaca and also in New York City. Um, that we will have permanent staff, um, including data analysts, postdocs, graduate students will have the opportunity to come to New York City in the summer to work on um, evaluation efforts. 
Um, also, there'll be opportunities also for undergraduate students. So we've been in conversation with some folks in BCTR about the existing resources there. And we definitely are identifying opportunities to collaborate. So one example is that it was clear that focus groups was something that was a, bit, a big strength of those who were engaging in evaluation work in BCTR. So it's possible that we're sharing contracts with one another or saying, hey, I know this is your area of expertise. Um, this is how you can maybe help with the ARC evaluation unit. Um, one thing I will say is the geography, especially in New York City, the need to have physical permanent staff in New York City um, mm -hmm. who are helping with evaluation efforts is, is critical because it's not just like we're getting data, right? Again, with this action research model, we're going in physically, meeting with partners, meeting with communities, thinking together, what are the things you're interested in? What are the appropriate methods? Um, to answer the questions that you have. And so we definitely are not in, in, in lieu of um, any of the evaluation efforts that are taking place in the BCTR. It's in collaboration with and expanding those efforts. Um, we had a meeting a couple of weeks ago, and I think the other unique thing is that we have a lot of people who have experience working with marginalized populations especially working in Black and Latinx populations who are part of ARC. And so I do think that that's a contribution that's already been identified with that our expertise working with some of these populations that are in urban spaces, um, we can, yeah, make some unique contributions. And then, Neil, yeah, I don't know if you had anything additional to say about the population yeah, no, um, unit. Want to echo, I mean, this, the point is to um, complement uh, the work and uh, do more together than uh, uh, we can do. Thank you. Uh, see John. Uh, John McKenzie. Hi, I'm John McKenzie, and I uh, I run this the studio lab, and we do some uh, outreach work with BIPOC communities, and both in this in the U.S. and uh, we also do some stuff abroad. I have a question. It's kind of an infrastructural question, and it points outward. Um, I was recently part of an NSF study that produced this report called. Uh, democratizing data and cyber structure. And these folks are, are action-based research, but these are like uh, com, you know computer CS people and info sci people. And um, they're very interested in the work that it's, that's happening here at Cornell because they recognize Cornell is both a, a, a public and a private, and they see there's really great things in our connection with 4-H. And so I'm wondering, so uh, what they, they turned me on to this consortium called the Minority Serving Computation Consortium, and I'm going to put this down in the uh, in the chat here. And I'm just and so what? Basically, this is like Internet too. Um, if you know this, is providing a cyber infrastructure for small communities across the state. Or and if folks aren't familiar with this, is sort of like uh, R ones. We have this this Internet too that basically the private IT companies have tried to take away from us. And so I'm wondering, is there a way? To, how how can your work and our work connect up here? And is that something you think your, your community partners would, would be interested in? Sure, I can uh, start. Um, so yeah, I'm. thanks for sharing uh, this link. Um, I'll take a closer look later, but uh, one of the things um, that's, I think, useful here is that thinking about the broader network of, of people um, that we'll have as part of this, including some um, folks who do work on um, issues around um, cyber in infrastructure and algorithmic bias um, and, um, you know, Nathan Matias, for instance, in the Department of Communication, um, his whole thing is about uh, democratizing uh, social science using um, um, internet-based internet methods and like to create more opportunities for marginalized groups to participate um, in the scientific process as well as how that process um, leads to policy changes. So um, I, you know, we'll take a closer look at this one, but um, this certainly feels like something that's, um, in line and could uh, could work. I don't know. That's sure what that there. Yeah, I, I would add that we are not married to a particular method. What we're what we're really committed to is the problem. And so, you know, when we work together and figure out, okay, here's the problem that is, we're experiencing, we're open to a host of methods. And I think that's one of the great things about ARC is bringing together people from multiple disciplines and also knowing, I, you know, I know Neil has shared some examples with me. Sometimes when we're sitting in these spaces, we're definitely asked to do something that's out of, outside of our area of expertise. And ARC is a way of saying, okay, because we're a do-think, 
a do tank, right? I can say, okay, this area of expertise sounds very much in the psychology field. Let me reach out to a colleague who is part of ARC, who's part of, who's doing action research. So I can say, I think X, Y, and Z method is appropriate, but this isn't, again, this is outside of my scope. Um, so again, that's been a problem in the past when you're going after some of these really large grants, um, being able to say like, you know, you get this feedback, like, oh, you're proposing something that's a little outside of your wheelhouse, but that sometimes we have to go outside of our wheelhouse and then quickly be able to pull together people who have expertise in that area. So again, with action research, we're not married to any particular method. We're really open. And again, it's about working in partnership with community saying, what are the problems? And then we can pull together what are the best methods. That's yeah, great. Yeah, quickly, add to one, one last thing that this report calls for, if you look at, they have a bunch of recommendations and it calls for redoing the way NSF approaches funding things and, and basically front loading people that usually at the end of the stream there. So there's tons of opportunities if the NSF takes up these recommendations and it's really exciting. Sorry, I inter interrupted you, Neil. No, thanks for raising that because, um, so the NIH asked me to be on an advisory group because they're having the same issue, right? So um, they, um, especially since the pandemic, uh, they stepped back and had this reflection on the way that they fund work. Um, this kind of work does not fit neatly into a lot of their models. And so they asked me to be on their advisory group and on the advisory group to help them sort of rethink, how do you do, um, how do you um, fund work? Um, in this case, it's on health behavior theories. That's the broad uh, realm that I'm in. Uh, but how do you um, change the structure of how they do funding um, to be able to support more work like this? Because they, they recognize it's important, but their current structures don't really work for that. So this is another place where, um, where that comes up. Um, but I think there's something else that Tashera just said that I, I think is useful to emphasize here um, with this approach um, and within the broader Cornell ecosystem, right? So sometimes we've um, built these entities that are organized around particular methods, sometimes around particular topics. Um, this is organized around the needs of the communities. So, um, uh, you know, to share his point um, about bringing together people with multiple um, disciplinary expertise, with multiple uh, methodological approaches. Um, it's whatever the communities need um, that's at the center of what we do. So I wanted to uh, clarify um, some of that. I see Pearl. Hi, thank you so much for everything you're doing. I think this is so fantastic. And I'm a postdoc based in New York City, been doing participatory research on urban soils and urban agriculture for about eight years. And I'm just wondering, how do you see people joining in or becoming part of your network? Neil, did you, you want me to answer? Okay. Yeah, you can start so, and then I'll Okay, so one thing is that we are being incredibly intentional and thoughtful about how we build this entity. Um, we really want to do this the right way, acknowledging even some of the things like John said, some of the issues we've experienced historically as academic institutions, challenges with these larger funding agencies. So what that means is that, you know, this semester and much of the summer is just creating infrastructure, our, our own infrastructure, you know, um, we're doing some, what is, what do they call it? Brand discovery, really? I, but I don't like that term, really. I like value discovery, right? Um, really thinking about what are our values? And so you've heard us say some words over and over again that were really intentional. One is marginalization. Again, this like time sensitive um, equ equity. And so this semester and the summer is very much about, yeah, value exploration, um, the hiring of the staff and training of staff. And then I feel like we'll be better in, in a better position in the like fall-ish to think about these larger potential collaborations. But we wanna make sure we have a strong sense of our own identity. Um, and also I wanna highlight that Neil and I are part of a lot of initiatives that are taking place on at, at the Cook campus and also at the medical school. So we've, we're, we're planning on being extremely collaborative with entities that we're already part of. Um, and we nonetheless see like ARC filling a niche that um, hasn't been filled yet. So 100% there will be opportunities um, for folks to engage. Um, but again, we wanna be really thoughtful about how that is and how, how to do so, how to do so. So to quickly add to that, um, here's another thing that happens uh, a lot is that um, sometimes um, 
entities try to go really big, really fast, take on a lot, people get burned out, and then the work stop. We don't want to do that, right? We want to make sure all of the support is there um, so that, and so you mentioned your postdoc, like imagine to being a postdoc coming into an entity and then they're like, all right, there are these hundred projects, like go, like, no, that, like that would um, overwhelm you, burn you out, um, all those things. So, um, so we're taking this time, like, you know, um, making sure we, we build up, um, we're starting small, um, um, to make sure we have the resources that, um, that are there to support everyone involved. And then we will slowly build up from there. So we want to make sure this is a sustainable um, thing for, uh, because otherwise we end up leaving the communities behind, like when we burn ourselves out and then um, we just can't keep the work going. So um, that's why we're uh, sort of taking this slow build up approach rather than the move fast and then uh, end up breaking things and ourselves. Uh, I saw Tony had a hand. Yeah, Tony. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks. I did. I had my hand up, but I think you just said exactly what I was going to say, so I I, I lowered it. Um, but let me let me just um, say that you know, um, hi everybody. I'm Tony Burrow, director of the Bronfen Burner Center, and the the historical arc of our arriving here is important. I'm so glad that Neil started with that because the journey, all of the thoughts and ideas and feelings that went into creating ARC mean something. And now that they're afloat and they're getting, getting started, I'm so happy that the world is getting introduced to, to ARC and what, what these folks are gonna do. Um, I just wanted to mention, I saw a question in the, in the chat about this is something that I've talked with others about. To some people, to a lot of people, I think ARC represents a, a promise. It, it's a promise of good work that's needed. And for others, it's a familiar promise. Is Neil open with how the origin of this idea uh, in name has been around our campus at in Cornell for a very long time. And so for some people, ARC's mission and sort of stated intention reminds them of other things. And I think that's fantastic because I think it is part and parcel of that. It's almost like if you hang out here long enough, this will be something you realize that you need to do. And that that's what I see ARC as, as an iteration and a, a new manifestation of an idea that has been around. But I also will attest as a director of the center, the intentionality that Teixeira speaks, speaks of is real. Um, the collection of people on campus for whom this is an identity is, is formidable. There's a lot of people on campus who do action research and identify that way. But I read into ARC that and more in that they're building an infrastructure to capitalize on the excellence, the research excellence, the, the interest, the knowledge that exists in campus and counties and communities um, that isn't wedded to any individual scholar's research agenda. It's the dynamic conversation. They're building something that will live on past them. This is not an extension of their laboratories. It's actually building a, a set of resources so that anybody can tether what they do and what they're interested in to pushing this whole thing forward. So I don't offer that as saying the existing networks in action research, this is something different. Maybe this is another hub in that network and they'll, and they'll find their way to that. Um, but there's real, I think, resources being thought through. Um, they spoke about its placement being supported by two colleges and living in the Bronfenbrenner Center. There's a novelty there and there's a strategy there about why that is and why that will be really helpful to faculty um, in ways that hopefully make the delivery of products and outcomes seamless. I don't think communities that these folks are trying to serve care much about whether this comes from human ecology or CCE or cows, they want the work that's done. And I think they're centering that approach and I, and I really value that. So I just wanna both publicly welcome ARC and, and its leadership and the fact that in your info session, you have this many people caring to hear more. I think the, the, the future is bright for what this group will be able to do. So thank you. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, appreciate Tony. It. And all of your support from the very beginning. So Tony was there at the, the original meetings uh, where uh, was brainstormed for all of this uh, stuff. It started, started from the bottom. So. <laughs> I also would highlight um, this New York City. Um, what does it mean to actually be able to function in New York City? And, you know, a lot of us, it sounds exciting to conduct research in New York City, but you know, again, we struggled with infrastructure. 
Um, how, think about this logistically. If I have a research program exclusively in New York City, but my doctoral students are taking classes. So they can't be in the city unless it's like the summertime or after they finish all of their coursework. And that's the case for a lot of faculty. You know, it's like there's a lot of interest to work and conduct action research in New York City. But if you can't get your trainees down there, except for these very specific times of the year, that's incredibly problematic. Um, how do you then cross train um, your, your staff and make and your undergraduate students and other people who support? So again, like we're really addressing some bar barriers who that people have experienced to doing work, especially in New York City, um, around the challenge of like staffing and support. Yeah, and just quickly on that point, um, this is where another place where um, the partnership and support of the colleges of really thinking through all of like having those um, really um, frank discussions uh, with the deans about like, what does this mean like um, to have a faculty member do this? What does it mean for an undergraduate to do this? Like, I mean, there's a lot of excitement around getting undergrads and um, um, these things are not, but like, let's talk through what that actually means given the course of an academic year, the course uh, of academic study, um, the physical uh, distance between being here in Ithaca in New York City um, and having the deep connections that you need to do this work. Well, let's talk through all of that and figure out how it's going to work. Where are they going to go? Um, wh where are they going to stay if they're, uh, they're working? Like that's why we sort of um, work to figure out that space issue um, there. Um, and who's going to be there to support them um, when they get there? Like sending a student down, oh, you can't like send them down and say, oh, go figure it out. And like, there's a lot you need to know and you need to have those connections. So we're really thinking through all of those um, both high level, um, um, questions as well as the nitty gritty on the ground, like how do you get it done? Like it has to be um, a multi um, pronged strategy here. And so having the buy in of um, the, the colleges, having the buy in of the staff, having the buy in of the communities, having the buy in of policymakers, getting like everyone to really get what needs to be done and for um, addressing the constraints that we all face, because we all have different set of constraints. Really working through that um, is essential for sustaining this work. Um, so we have a question about the project. So how, um, so yeah, <laughs> um, this is a great question about where the project's coming from. Are they coming from us going to communities or communities coming to us? Um, and I think we're open to both approaches, um, but um, so we don't, what we don't want, <laughs> uh, maybe I'll start there. What we don't want is a situation where um, it's, I'm a researcher, I have this idea for a project because I, and I need a community partner to write my grant, um, otherwise I'm not gonna get funded. Um, and then I only um, work with them if we get funding, the issue that the sheriff mentioned. This, this is something, frankly, that has, the reason we keep bringing it up is it's an issue that's been raised by many community partners about their frustrations with Cornell. Of researchers coming in and are only wanting to work with them um, like to get the grant and then if the grant doesn't get funded, they left. Um, strung out to dry. Um, so um, we want to be able to, of course, support um, projects that um, are research driven, but we also wanna um, make sure this work is going to be beneficial um, to communities and is addressing their needs. So sometimes people come to us, um, sometimes we see um, identified mutual opportunities. Um, either direction can work, but we need to do it in a way that um, is uh, mutually um, um, beneficial there. And I can also add to that, that um, because again, my comment around we are in community and with community, um, I, I'm housed, right? Like I am in community. And so it's nothing to be like, okay, we were working on one project and then it's like, hey, to share, we also are dealing with X, Y, and Z. Um, and I think that that's the other thing is that we are committed to being in like the, to the actual community. Um, so, and then also, I think in terms of people reaching out to us, I think that the evaluation unit is going to have infrastructure again for people to say, hey, um, I'll give an example. So I was given a talk at the Federal Reserve last fall because they're interested in how 
and food insecurity. And if you don't address food insecurity, how that impacts the workforce. And so I was giving a talk and then afterwards, a large um, nonprofit organization reached out and said, hey, we do food insecurity work in New York City, but again, we don't have an evaluation team. And so we are, we are exploring the possibility of them working through the evaluation unit for us to help with evaluating their longstanding program. So that's just one example of how like someone could reach out to us through the evaluation unit and we can determine again, like if there's a fit there. Um, but again, because we are in community, a lot of times it's organic in, in the ways in which projects arise. Marilu, is that? Yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Tashara and Neil. Like, it's really, really cool what you guys are doing and really interesting. And uh, I work at, at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, uh, Project Assistant of Celebrate Urban Birds, and the Noise Project a Facilitator uh, in, in a community led. This is a community led uh, uh, science uh, uh, project. Uh, and we have uh, researchers. And my question is, uh, I'm interested in, in, in uh, your evaluation uh, unit, like um, how is community expertise integrated uh, and how communities included in evaluation, are they included in the design or process? Uh, uh, do you have community researchers and included? And, and I'm just talking from, from our experience because we have a, a, a is community led and community, uh, takes, um, directs it and participates in every step of the way of the research. And we are doing, engaging now in analysis of our research and it's been like, wow, transformative, incredible, and getting all those viewpoints that traditional uh, uh, researchers, scientists uh, can bring, like we, we have, we bring like, okay, the academia side and we bring our own viewpoints, but having a, a community actually uh, leading and they, they took the, the city uh, 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 training and, and they are bringing visualizations uh, to explore theories and enriching is amazing. So I'm just curious if, if you, uh, how do you include our community and, and if so how, and, and if not, I mean, if, 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 and if not, then if you would uh, consider that. Thank you. So the short answer is yes, 100%. Um, so we are working in partnership with communities from the, usually from the beginning to end. I think there are circumstances, right? If someone reaches out to us where it's like, we've already developed X, Y, and Z, can you help us do something very specific? But for the most part, I would say we're in partnership from the beginning to the end. Um, sometimes, people want to become community researchers, right? And they're interested in doing the city trainings in other ways, like there are other times where that's not true, but I think this is where communication is key. So we have these very open and honest conversations about like how, what is everybody's role? Who wants to be involved in what? What are each of our strengths? And then we work together to, to come up with a plan, but a hundred percent, you know, I mentioned that ACE pro, um, program in partnership with 4-H and Again, we had an advisory council that, in, that consisted of high school students um, that we did focus groups with the eighth grade students. We had principals and teachers and other people who were involved from the very beginning um, to make sure that we were working, working co collaboratively on, on the project. So thank you so much for bringing that up um, because no, we're not coming in trying to be saviors. Um, we are just saying like, again, we wanna be in community and um, work together. Yeah, I mean, um, quickly adding to share, yeah, having um, involvement through the, the full life cycle of, of the work, um, so one way of thinking about it, um, is really critical. Um, so that is in figuring out what the right questions are to ask um, and how do we go about asking it um, um, through like doing the work. And then, um, you know, the another point you mentioned was analyzing the data. So in doing this work, like when analyzing data, going back um, and talking with uh, community stakeholders about uh, what we're finding, like um, making sure that we're getting it right, that's that's critical, um, right? So it's not just to do this and then, again, publish in our journals, um, but making sure that um, those um, perspectives are um, really accurately represented um, and the work is absolutely uh, critical. 
Thank you. You mentioned, uh, uh, Tashara, you mentioned this, that you don't want to be saviors, and I just want to share with you all, and some of you, if you don't, uh, don't know about our, our ICBO research, uh, our community researchers, they, uh, they came up uh, in one of the theories with the savior syndrome, actually, and they define it, as, and it's one of our codes, and it's like a uh, savior syndrome, uh, uh, it's like uh, they say, I'm going to, with here, institutional responses also focus a great deal on saving teaching or changing behaviors of the community. Uh, and, and they have all these theories, save your syndrome or I know what you need. Really, really cool. They named yeah. it that. Another thing, of course, that comes up in this realm is um, the, the helicoptering um, in. Like that's um, another thing that um, people have reflected many times is uh, being something they don't uh, particularly like. Um, for understandable reasons. So. Yeah. One thing also when you think about deliverables that I want to acknowledge is, um, you know, again, in the academic world, we're very much expected to publish these scientific journals, uh, publish in scientific journals. But again, I can't hand that to a community partner. I can't hand that to a policy maker. And so one of the things ARC is also thinking about is, again, talking with community about like what what is it that you need? Like, how would you like this information presented? And a lot of what times it's infographics of findings, right? And so we we have a team of folks who are really dedicated and capable of creating like these beautiful infographics because oftentimes that's more useful than this 20 page scientific paper. But again, a lot of us researchers weren't trained to make infographics, right? And so that's where having like a dedicated team where again, if you're affiliated with ARC or ARC members can say, hey, I have this great study. Um, can I work with an ARC graduate student and can they take this study and turn it into an infographic that then we can share with the community partners? And again, community partners may need a host of different deliverables, but that's why it's just important to, to ask those questions and to work together to figure out what, what that is. And then Tony, if you wanna close us, I don't know if you want to close us out. We have just two more minutes. Yeah, final question or comment from Tony. Yes. That's that's way too much pressure. So somebody else will say, <laughs> say something. Please say something after I say this. I just thought this is a fascinating question in the chat. Uh, the distinction between translational research and, and action research. Um, I would love to have that conversation more broadly I, with, with so many people in this room. I think it'd be interesting just dialogue and discussion. But one, you know, um, as, as director of the BCTR, what I, something I think a little bit about is I, I see personally I see translational research as a slightly broader um, umbrella, a canopy for all kinds of work of which action research may be one of them um, under the umbrella that may be different methodologies. Um, if, for example, action research were to inherently involve sort of communities and researchers working together to devise, what is the question of interest here? What, what do we see as the opportunity or problem or issue? What methods are relevant? Um, what inferences should we draw and what should we do about it? It's sort of a collaborative sort of process the, whole, the entire way. I think that represents a kind of translational research. There are others though. There are many projects in the Bronfman Brenner Center that start as laboratory projects and the, and the translational work is that, is how do we disseminate, how do we, how do we dis describe and draw inferences that are relevant to communities that weren't there when, when, when the question came up, but we think this has relevant relevance for them or vice versa. Uh, a, a community organization is, is implementing a program and they have already collected evidence but they need help analyzing it. There's translation there. And I would, I would end by saying, even the study of the process of this work can be translational research or translational science. And so there are people who'd be very interested in watching, observing what ARC does, what kinds of issues or partnerships emerge from ARC. And that itself can be a kind of translational research endeavor that itself might not be action research, but it certainly can be translational. So there's, to me, it's a, it's a broader umbrella, umbrella of which ARC is one important node. So, yeah. And thank you all for attending today. We really appreciate um, you coming and having this conversation with us. Um, it, it is the beginning uh, of the conversation mm -hmm. and of doing this work. Um, we know we're at time, so um, thanks again. Um, and have, enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>